Good? Yeah? Let's try this again. Happy Friday. Happy Friday, Mr. Hopkins. You look beautiful today. I just want that on record. Okay. Um, all right. So the topics we're going to do today, hopefully we'll do it fairly quickly here, are monopsony and union. So the effect that, you know, so, so where you have power on the supply side, okay, of, of the labor market, that's when you have unions, okay, and when you have power on the demand side, when the business has some power, um, that's called monopsony. Okay, so we'll, we'll we'll discuss those two things. So first, monopsony. Okay, so what we just what we talked about so far are perfect competitive labor markets where there are lots of workers all freely sort of selling their labor and 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 there's lots of firms um, competing for those workers. Okay, and in that situation, firms are wage takers. Right, they have to accept the wage that is set by by, by the forces of supply and demand in the market. Okay. Um, in many situations, uh, you don't have a competitive labor market. You have one firm or a few firms that do most of the hiring in an industry, meaning you know, whatever people's skill set is, is, is best suited for, there might be only two, one, two, or three firms for them to work for, okay? And so they don't have as much choice, and so the firm has a little bit of power um, in terms of setting the wage. And of course, if they're rational, they'll try to pay workers as little as possible while still being able to employ them. So what we see in monopsony is the amount of labor hired is restricted. It's less than you would have in the perfectly competitive situation, and the wage is lower. Okay, so let's discuss that. I talked about that a little bit. Um, and so the classic example of a monopsonist uh, would be like a coal mine, the owner of a coal mine in a small town. So you're in a rural area like West Virginia or rural China, and, um, and the mine, essentially, is the, is, is, is the only employer in town. Okay, you know, there might be a few other things you can get a job doing, but basically, most people in town work for the coal mine, right? They can't get to, you know, they're, they're geographically isolated, so there aren't other jobs, other places they can go and, and get work. They basically have to work at the one place that, that, that employs people in town, that's the coal mine. That gives the coal miner a great deal of power in terms of setting the wage. Okay, what does that look like? Okay, so uh, in this situation, whereas in perfect, the perfectly competitive situation, you had a horizontal supply curve for the firm. This is the firm, right? Um, you had a horizontal supply curve for the firm, and here you have an upward sloping supply curve because the, the firm essentially is the market, right? So the supply curve um, for the firm is the market supply curve, okay? So it's upward sloping. So if it's upward sloping, it means that as the firm hires more workers, it has to <coughs> pay them more, right? That's what we move to the right here along the horizontal axis. You have to pay workers more and more and more. That's the upward sloping supply curve, okay? If that's the case, you can have a marginal resource cost curve, which is above the uh, supply curve, because when you hire one new worker, you now have to pay all your workers the higher wage. So it's not just that additional worker you have to pay the higher wage. Once you hire that person and offer them the higher wage, the assumption in this model is that you have to pay all workers the higher wage, and thus the marginal resource cost, the extra cost of hiring that worker, um, is actually greater than the wage you have to pay that worker, as this curve is always greater than this curve, where the price or the value on this curve is always higher than the value on the supply curve, okay? As a consequence, then, then, then you look at where, how, how much labor will um, this monopsonist hire, and just like in uh, the perfectly competitive situation, they're gonna hire labor as long as the uh, benefit, the marginal revenue product of hiring that labor is greater than the cost, the marginal cost, which is here, the marginal resource cost, so we'll hire labor here at the intersection of MRC and MRP, okay? giving us our monopsonist's uh, quantity of labor. Right? So this is the quantity of labor that the monopsonist hires. Okay? Now, the monopsonist doesn't have to pay the workers uh, this amount in order to get this many workers. In order to get this many workers, right? this, is the, this is the supply of those workers, right? He only has to pay them this value, W sub M. Okay? That's the monopsonist. This would be the competitive wage Right? 
where you have, sorry, this would be the competitive way where supply and demand intersect, right? So in the perfect competitive situation, right, like we had before, that would be the way that the monopsonist is able to pay his workers or her workers less, okay? And so the main effects here are that quant the quantity of labor hired is lower, there's less work, right, less employment, okay? And the wage rate is lowered. That's obviously good for the firm, not for the worker, okay? Now, historically, historically, what uh, what workers did um, during uh, during especially during the, the late latter part of the 1800s and then throughout the 1900s, they organized. They were the counter and the monopsony power. Okay, so in order to counter the power of monopsonists. Monopsonists, workers would organize into what they called unions. Okay, so I'm going, to, I'm going to present to you three examples of different kinds of unions and how those unions benefit workers at the expense of the business. Okay, um, the first kind of union, okay, the first model, is known as the demand enhancement model. Okay, so what this uh, an example of this would be. American, the American Automobile Union um, during the 1980s. Okay, so the late 1970s and early 1980s, uh, Ameri American, the American automobile industry began to experience a lot of competition from, from foreign producers of cars, especially from Japan, okay? And as the years went on, it was, it was even Korean and so forth and so on, as you know. But initially, the main competition was coming from Japan. Americans had always bought uh, American automobiles like Fords and, um, and Chevys and so forth. When I was growing up, we had a Ford, we had a Chevy, we had a Dodge. They were all American-made vehicles, right? We had a giant Suburban. I mean, it's huge, right? It got eight miles to the gallon, right? And in the 70s, oil prices spiked. Right? Oil prices went up, and driving that became very burdensome for us. We, we, you know, it, was, it was a big expense every week that my parents really couldn't afford. Right? So we sold that, and my father bought a Toyota. Right? We never owned uh, a Japanese automobile, any, we never, never owned anything but an American automobile. And that Toyota was amazing. We got like probably at, at that time, it's not much now, but at that time we got, we got 28, 29, 30 miles to the gallon. Right, and uh, it, it, it would go forever. Whereas the American cars were breaking down before 100,000 miles, you could drive the Toyota up to like 200,000 miles, and, and, and it would still work. And so my parents, since that day, have never bought anything but a Toyota. Okay, and so this is what the <laughs> right. I mean, that's just my parents. Right? Um, <laughs> uh, I'll probably say my own. But in any, in any case, they uh, that's the kind of competition that the American automobile industry was experiencing, okay? And as a consequence, um, American automobile makers were making fewer cars and had to shut down some factories and factory workers were losing their jobs, okay? Um, you know, uh, in, in workers in car factories were losing their jobs. The American Automobile Union, the American auto workers, um, then sort of countered this, tried to sort of fight this, by uh, this problem for their workers by um, promoting a campaign called Buy American. So they ran television commercials and put, put ads in newspapers where they would promote the idea that you should buy American because that was the sort of patriotic thing to do. If you were buying a Japanese car, then you were unpatriotic, right? So we weren't very popular in town with those Toyota. Um, Okay, and so those, I, I can still remember those commercials on TV for the American, you know, buy American, and it was like a sort of an American flag kind of floating in the background and stuff. <laughs> and, and the idea there is that what that should do is increase the demand for American automobiles, right? It changes, the, it, it changes what determinant, tastes and preferences, right? Okay, so it affects people, some people are going to go, who would have otherwise bought a Japanese car, yeah. I should buy American. If I'm an American, I should buy an American car. And so it increases the demand for American cars 
Um, and what that does, of course, is it increases the, the demand for labor, right? As we know, labor is a derived demand, right? And so the demand for labor is derived from the demand for product. So when the demand for cars goes up, the demand for auto workers goes up, and their wage rises, okay? Okay, that's good for everyone. So this, this model is good for the workers, and it's good for the business, right? The other two um, are different, okay? They're good for the workers, but not good for the business. Okay. The craft model, the ex uh, sort of exclusive model, okay, is one where sort of like teachers, doctors, and, uh, and lawyers use, okay, in order to artificially increase their wage. Okay, so basically what this comes down to is licensing. If you want to be a teacher, you want to be a doctor, you want to be a lawyer, you have to, for law, you have to pass the bar. For medicine, you have to pass all kinds of uh, exams, right? And for, uh, and for teaching, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, you, have to get, you have to get a certificate, you have to, you have to get an education, you get a degree, and you have, to, you have to pay a little bit of money and learn a little bit about teaching, right? And so what that does in all three situations is it restricts supply, right? Some people can't pass the bar, some people can't um, you know, pass the medical exams and, and or afford to go to those, that many years of school. And, 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 and in teaching, some people can't afford to get the master's degree or whatever is necessary in order to get the, the license. And so it causes the supply of lawyers, the supply of doctors, and the supply of teachers, and any other um, uh, profession or job where a, a license is required, it restricts supply, causing the wage to rise, be higher than it would in a competitive situation, right? So all of us, teachers, lawyers, and others who require these licenses, make more as a result. Now that can be justified on the grounds that we want to make sure that our doctors know what they're doing, that our lawyers know the law and teachers know how to teach. Um, but you can't change, you can't argue with the fact that it restricts supply and causes the price to be higher. So that's the craft model. So whereas that's the exclusive model, this is the inclusive model, okay? In this, this, this is the kind of union you probably, when you think of unions, this is what you think of. Okay, this would be the, the, the like American steel workers, the American uh, United Auto Workers, right? These are, uh, these are industrial or inclusive unions, okay? What they try to do, the teachers union, okay? What they try to do is they try to get everybody in the union. So whereas the, 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 in the last case, you're trying to exclude people from the profession, here you're trying to get everybody in the profession into the union, okay? And what they do is they make bargain collectively. So normally like where I would negotiate my salary or my wage with, with my business individually, in this situation, you can do it collectively. It, it then gives those workers more power. And the power comes from the threat to strike. Okay, so through this, in this example, the power of collective bargaining is that everybody bargains for one wage, right, and a, and a certain set of benefits, and if they don't get it, they all walk out, and they don't work, and that shuts down production. Okay, and so then the uh, then the business is faced with a situation where they either pay their workers or they don't produce. And it's just basically a cost-benefit situation for them, right? which, which is worse, okay? Um, and so eventually then what should happen in this situation if it works for the union is that the wage, a, a wage should be negotiated, W sub U here, which is greater than the wage that would be, that would, that would prevail if each worker negotiated his contract individually. Okay, that was the case with you here, okay, but with, uh, with the union, you get a higher wage, everyone gets paid that way, so this becomes a supply curve, okay, so this is the supply curve in this situation, okay, and as you can see, the wage goes up, and the other effect is that the quantity of labor hired goes down, okay, so the business will hire fewer people, but the people who, 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 who keep their jobs are... Or, or remain in the industry, we'll get paid more. 
Okay. Where was the flag that started going up? Yeah. What's that? Why was the flag that started going up? Yeah. Because it intersects the normal, so here it intersects the normal supply curve. Right? So, so here's where the supply curve would be. Yeah. Right? But once it intersects the, 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 the what, what would be the supply curve without the union, okay, then, okay, then the business at that point, right, the business is going to, what's, what's happening here with the supply curve? What's, why is it up or sloping? The reason it's up, it's sloping, is because as you hire more workers, those other workers are have, are coming out of other industries, right? They currently they're working in other industries. Why? Because they can make more money in those other industries. Make sense? Okay. And so, uh, and, and and so in order to bid them into your industry, in order to employ them, you have to pay them at least what they're making in the other industry. Okay, and so here, okay, at this point, you hit that point where you have to, you have, you, you start employing workers at this point, at this wage, right? Okay, up until this wage, you can have people, you can get people into your industry, okay, um, without having to pay them more, right? Normally, if you, without the union, right, and if you're only employing this many workers, you don't have to pay them this much, right? But with the union, you pay them this much, you can see it. At you know any quantity up until here, you can continue to pay pay this much to get workers, right? Because these workers only require you know a lower amount, a lower wage, right? Without having to increase the wage, right? But at this point, you have to increase increase the wage for things to slope up. Well, I'm about to do explanation. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Okay, and then the last situation here is where you have what's called a bilateral monopoly. Um, and again, this is a lot like a coal mine in a, in a rural town. All right, so what happens, you have a coal mine, the coal miner is, um, is the one employer in town, and so then all the workers organize, and they form a union, and so you have a monopsony power on, this, on, on the demand side, with the business, okay, and union power, inclusive union power, on the supply side, with labor. Okay, and then the question is, how much labor will be hired in this situation, and what will they be paid? And the answer is, we don't know, okay? Um, but what should happen here is the union's gonna demand a wage at W sub U, like in the last model. The monopsonist wants to pay W sub M, right? The monopsony wage, okay, and then they're going to negotiate. Okay, the union's going to say we want this. The employer's going to say I want to pay you this, and then they're going to sit down at the table and negotiate. He says I want to pay you this. They say if you pay, if you want to pay us that, we're going to walk out and strike. And he'll say okay, I'll pay you a little bit, bit more, but I won't pay you this. Okay, and so where you have both both monopsony power and union power, the wage the, the wage that prevails that's negotiated should fall somewhere in this range, but we don't know precisely where, okay? That's it.